Here again, Matthew chapter 25, verse 6. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. We pray. Heavenly Father, these are your words. Sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Tick. There's a pendulum clock running, and you can hear it. There's movement. There's progress. But as you listen, after the tick, there's nothing. And you think to yourself, uh, is time standing still? Or is the clock broken? Or did I just imagine that there was a tick? One Lutheran pastor wrote, All of history is one executed plan of God's. Moses says that a thousand years in God's sight pass like a day. Like a work shift in the afternoon, God has laid out what to him is a very small, tight plan that's being unraveled in the world. We could say that God's plan is so sure of being completed that the whole history of the world could be summed up and compared to a single second. Tick, tock. Creation, the end of the world. When Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden and they had just sinned, God came to them and he promised them someone who would come and crush this snake and destroy sin and death to which they were now subject. That was God's promise. You could say that was tick. And we know because of who God is, because he is faithful, that there will be a talk. When Jesus Christ came into the world, he reconciled all things to God in himself. He came and did defeat Satan, that snake. He overcame sin and death for us. In the verses before us today, in the Gospel lesson, Christ is predicting the end of the world when he will return and he will take his believers out of this veil of tears to the joys of heaven. Tick. And by faith, we also hear the talk. And with that, the midnight hour strikes, the bridegroom comes, and we enter into this marriage feast. At this midnight hour, when Jesus returns, the invisible will become visible. The invisible faith specifically, that is inside of Christians, will now become apparent for everyone to see. The lessons taught in these words of Christ um, have some overlap with the lessons Jesus taught us last week when he talked about the last judgment and the sheep and the goats. There he made it very clear that it is faith in him alone that will save us. Faith in him alone that will rescue us from our sin and all of our failures in God's sight. We will have good works Christians will show good deeds to others in love, but that's merely a sign that this faith is living within us. Well, that imagery um, is used in a different way in this lesson. The oil in the lamps of these bridesmaids represents the true faith in the hearts of believers. That oil produces a flame when it's lit. Those are like our good works. They're seen to the world, and yet it's not the flame that saves us. That's not the, the ultimate uh, important piece. It's the oil that we need. But this text goes a step further. It doesn't just tell us how we can withstand that judgment, how we can get to heaven, but it also warns us who are connected to the church about a way that we might miss out on heaven. The lamps, which are spoken of in these verses, represent an outward connection to God's word, to his church. And all the bridesmaids have them, even those who finally are kicked out of the wedding hall and not let back in. Jesus is recognizing that there's the possibility someone can know about God's grace. Someone can be a member of a church and receive the sacrament and yet take those gifts that God has given him and throw them away. Paul talks about people like this. He says they have the form of godliness, right? Just looking at them, they have the lamp. It looks like they have uh, genuine Christian faith. But Paul says they deny its power. It's as if they can go through all the motions, and yet it's like they're holding up a shield in front of them, blocking God's grace from giving them any benefit, and of course also blocking any of their prayers going to God. When Christ returns, he will not look for those who simply have a lamp. He will look for those who have a lamp full of oil that burns. Now, just because faith is 
invisible. You know, just because oil can't be seen when it's inside the lamp, that doesn't mean that there's no way we can tell who are believers in the world. Or there's no way we can tell uh, where we can go to find this oil. In the parable, you could say, even if uh, the lamps all look the same, those which have oil and those which don't, you can see in the lives of uh, those wise bridesmaids that they went and prioritized getting oil. They made sure to have enough for the wedding night that was coming. So too, Jesus has attached very concrete markers to his church, very concrete markers where he says, if you find these, you will also find my believers. Jesus says that his believers will abide in his word. So there's an emphasis on God's word, that it will be valued among uh, Christ's believers, that they will confess the truth, they will baptize and they will teach, they will celebrate the Lord's Supper, they will offer prayers to him, they will show love toward one another and compassion and help. Jesus says, where you see these marks, there you will find my believers and vice versa. So there's a balance uh, as we apply this text to our lives. Yes, Christian faith is invisible. It's something that resides inside of us. And at the same time, that Christian faith is only nurtured by these outward means. God's word and baptism and the Lord's Supper. That's where God says you can find this faith and have it strengthened. So there's both an invisible aspect and a visible aspect, just like these bridesmaids. Right? They have both the visible aspect of the lamp, which represents outward connection to God's church, but also the substance of Christianity, this faith that clings to Christ for forgiveness. So you have to have both a lamp and oil. <laughs> That's a takeaway from this text. I don't think that the foolish bridesmaids were really so dull to think that they could burn their lamps without oil. The problem was they didn't prioritize getting oil. They pushed it off in their lives. Just like so often people who maybe even grow up in the church can push it off and say, well, I'll worry about genuine faith and real spirituality and uh, confessing my sins later on in life. I have plenty of time. But the verses that we've read today and for the last few weeks tell us, no, things will be going on as if they're going to continue when Christ comes back. That's the point. He'll come like a thief in the night. The wise bridesmaids even tell the foolish ones, go out and buy oil. They assume that there are a lot of dealers who are selling oil. The problem is, though, that it's too late. It's too late. By the time Christ comes back, that will not be the time to seek his grace in word and sacrament. That time will be past. He calls us with his gospel now. And he calls all people. So you can't have a lamp without the oil. I also want to reverse that, though, because the reverse is true. We don't have oil without a lamp. Today, you'll hear this expressed in our culture with the saying, Christianity is a relationship, not a religion. Right? Christianity is the oil, right? Having a relationship with Christ, which we do. But it's not a religion. I don't need a lamp uh, to have my oil. Well, no, the lamp is what holds the oil. It's what keeps it for you when you really need it in life. It's how you use it properly, right? Only with the lamp is the oil used to uh, productively burn and give off light. So, too, Christ never points us away from the concrete church. It's true that Christ and the Old Testament prophets would condemn and deride those church leaders who were abusing their positions of power. Jesus criticized the Pharisees but not because they were involved with institutional religion. It was because they were laying burdens on people instead of grace that would forgive sins. The prophets, before Christ came, would sometimes criticize those people who were administrating the temple. But it wasn't because the temple was bad. God had given them the temple as a way to distribute his grace and forgiveness to them. The prophets criticized those leaders because they were using their positions for personal financial, social, political gain, and not for the good of God's people. To <clears throat> tie this lesson back to the imagery of the text, just think of a wedding. Think of the weddings that you have attended. I would say that weddings are some of the most structured, some of the most rigidly scheduled parties I have ever been to. And yet, who would say that weddings are boring and dull and ritualistic because of that? 
You know, you show up at a wedding and first you go to the ceremony and there are very specific steps that you have to take even just as a, uh, a, uh, an audience member at a wedding. You stand up when the bride is coming down the aisle. Um, you witness, you serve as a witness to these people exchanging vows to show their commitment to each other. There's often very specific kinds of music that are played. Then you go to the reception hall and even there, there's a, a certain kind of ritual we could say. You stand in line, you sign the guest book, you put your gift on the table and your card in a box and then you go have hors d'oeuvres. And then pretty soon they announce that the bridal party's here. So then we watch them run or dance in to the head table. And then there's a prayer and the meal, and then they cut the cake and take pictures and uh, toast. And then finally the dance ensues for the night, right? All of these steps that you could say, wow, that is a very complicated liturgy that you're following. How boring. <laughs> and we would say, absolutely not. Weddings are the, the place where we show some of our most exuberant joy. Uh, in life. And I would say that that structure gives us the freedom to do so. When you're at a wedding, you almost don't have to think about what comes next. You don't have to worry about what you're doing because you know what's going to happen. But that means that you can truly be present in what's happening. So too, the outward church provides us with a structure, with liturgies to follow here in the service, with prayers that we can do, daily devotions and things like that. It gives us a certain way to think about God as we find him in his word. And that frees us up from the necessity to define God on our own terms. God reveals himself to us. That's the great blessing of Christianity. It is a revealed religion. God gives us an order and a structure in order to free us. Now, we could also say that he gave us that order and structure to free us in the sense of his commandments. Right? God gave us commandments about how we should behave throughout our lives. And those were given for our good. If you want to have a happy marriage, follow God's directions for a marriage. You know, he gives you order not to bind you, but to make it so that you can really truly show love and be present in the relationships he puts you in. So Christ, when he came, you can picture his life as following this order perfectly. Christ's whole life was following God's order for how humans were supposed to be. And then when Christ went to the cross... Picture him uh, using the imagery of the wedding as the perfect groom. Elsewhere, Paul calls the church the bride of Christ, and Christ has given his life for his wife. What a sense of sacrifice. When Christ was on the cross, now we could say, it was as if the oil of salvation was gushing out. You know, Our Lord suffering and dying for us when we should have been the ones in that position of danger. That is the atoning sacrifice that is the anchor of our faith. That is what we grab onto. Because Christ did that, we know that we can look forward to heaven. So as we wait then, Jesus at the end of this text says, watch because you don't know the day or the hour. So how do we prepare for that day rightly? Well, the principal way to watch, as Jesus commands, is to stay at the source of the oil. Jesus says you can find the strength and the creation of faith in my word and in baptism and in the Lord's Supper. These are the spigots, you might say, of God in the world where this oil is poured out into our lamps. We don't have to do anything. God comes and in his service he gives gifts to us. So stay connected to the oil. A second way to watch is to encourage and support others, especially those in our church family. You know, because, like I said, here uh, the imagery suggests that these foolish bridesmaids are meant to represent people who had some connection to church but just rejected what was being offered there. And we don't want that to happen. Imagine, if you will, that there were, earlier on in this day, before the wedding, in the parable, there were six foolish bridesmaids and four wise ones. And one of the wise ones said to her friend, you know what, you've never procrastinated like this, getting oil before. Why don't, why don't we go together and get oil? Why don't you dig deeper into the life of the church and claim this grace that God is giving to you in absolution, the grace that God has given to you in your baptism? For that bridesmaid, the support and encouragement of her friend made all the difference. 
Finally, we can watch properly by resting. All of the bridesmaids rest, and we don't have to interpret that as a sense of laziness, but I think that we can make a a comparison to all people in life, whether you're a Christian or not. All people, if you live long enough and think about life's questions, you find a certain sense of rest, right? People find answers to the questions of where did I come from or how should I live my life or where do I find meaning for it. But for the unbeliever, for the person who's not connected to Christ, that rest is a naive, foolish one. Just think of those bridesmaids. They had time to get the oil, and they're resting because they're totally unaware of what they actually need. Whereas for Christians, the rest is a confident rest. A rest knowing that we have been given everything that is necessary for entrance into this beautiful marriage feast that's prepared for us. So think of a Christian like someone standing in the middle of a holiday party. In the next several weeks, many of us will probably uh, enjoy some of these kinds of parties where we meet with uh, friends and we enjoy good food and good conversation and fun. So think of a, a person standing in the middle of the party. It's very late at night. And everyone else is busy, bustling around, paying attention to other things. The drinks, the hors d'oeuvres, the games, the conversation. And through the din of it all, though, the Christian hears, tick. And she knows that midnight is about to strike. The world around us is totally unaware of what's about to happen. And yet we Christians, we hear the words of Christ and we hear, tick, the end is coming. And that's a good thing for us. When that water first splashed on your head, charged with God's word in baptism, you heard it, tick. The scriptures are opened and we see Christ saying, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Not just rest here, but rest eternally. Tick. We see Jesus on the cross, and this criminal who is crucified beside him, who repents of his sin and shows his trust in Christ, Jesus says to him, Today you will be with me in paradise. We can hear for our lives. Tick. Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Tick. Wake up, Jesus says. Tick. The bridegroom is here. You finally made it. Talk. Amen. Please rise for the blessing. The peace of God which passes all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.